Welcome to the Daily Office Lectionary. I'm Father Reed. Today we're going to look at scriptures from Sunday to Saturday on the week of Third Epiphany, or the third Sunday after the Epiphany. Now, the Epiphany is an immovable date. That date is January the 6th. January the 6th. We are celebrating on January the 6th, the coming of the Magi, to give go- gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to Jesus. Very famous scripture from Matthew chapter 2. And then we have the Sundays following. How many Sundays are there going to be, or how many weeks of Epiphany will there be? Well, that depends on when Easter is, because there are five weeks in Lent, and there are Epiphany weeks that run into them, and we have Ash Wednesday, where we make the transition from Epiphany to Lent. So, we will do Epiphany 3 this week, and Epiphany 4 next week, and Epiphany 5 the following week, and I believe then we do the last Sunday after the Epiphany. Now, we're going to be looking at scriptures, as we did last week, in Genesis, Hebrews, and John. So, again, we have that triumvirate in the Old Testament, looking at the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Old Testament. The book of Hebrews, which comes after the letters of Paul, the 13 letters of Paul. And then the Gospel of John, which is the fourth Gospel after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, if you are listening as you're driving, as I mostly listen when driving, or making my breakfast, or making lunch or something, or you might be watching, uh, we uh, ask you to get your Bibles out and open your Bible to Genesis 13. You can see the scriptures in your post, this post, and uh, you can look them up and check them over these, this seven-day period. All right, let's look at them. Uh, this is Genesis 13, 2 to 18. This is Abram goes up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife Sarah and everything he had and Lot went with them and Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. All right, so what's going to happen here, uh, Abram calls on the name of the Lord at the end of verse 4, and Abram says to Lot in verse 8, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you. Let's part company. If I go to the left, if you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot looked up, and he made a decision based on what he saw. So verse 11, Lot chose for himself the whole plain plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east, and the two men parted company. So Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. You've probably heard of that uh, place before, Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Verse 13. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, now his name had not been changed to Abraham, so we're still with Abram. Lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west. Verse 15, all the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. So here's the promise that he makes regarding the land. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So this is the promise that Abram receives from God regarding the land that he is going to be given by God. And in the future, it will be for the Israelites. And we're going to see this in Joshua. So Joshua, it's a long story from Genesis to uh, Deuteronomy. Then we begin with Joshua. Joshua is the one that's going to lead them uh, from the east to the west, as they look westward, he's going to lead them into that land that God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's the introduction. In chapter 14, we see Melchizedek, king of Salem, a very complicated man, brought bread and wine. He was priest of the Most High God. He blessed Abram. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Here's where we see the beginning of the idea of the tithe, the tenth of everything. Tithe means means temp, tenth. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. Um, 
I have raised my hand to the Lord, Abram said in verse 22, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a thong of a sandal, so that you'll never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me. Okay, let them have their share. In chapter 15, we see the covenant that God makes with Abram. The covenant he makes with Abram. Abram believed the Lord in verse 6. And he credited to him as righteousness. Now there's the idea of faith and the coupling of faith with righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the earth of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. So as you remember in uh, chapter 12, God is calling Abram from the earth of the Chaldeans. And he is going to give him land. And the Israelites are going to be the chosen people. And out of that group of people, the Messiah is going to come. But this is going to take a very long time, thousands of years before this happens. Okay? A couple thousand years before this happens. All right. Um, he says in verse 13 of chapter 15, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years later. Um, in the fourth generation, verse 16, your descendants will come back here for the sin of the Amorites has not reached its full measure. So on verse 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. And he said, to, this descend to your descendants, I'm going to give them this land. So he marks out what the land is, and he also lets them see who is in the land. So there's presently people in the land. They're going to have to dis be displaced so that Israel can be in that land that God has promised them. In chapter 16, we have the famous Ag Hagar and Ishmael. Uh, Abram's wife, Sarah, had no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. And since he has, she has not conceived, we have a conception from Hagar and Ishmael is the child, but this is not the child of the promise. This is not the child of the promise, okay? This is, this is where a tremendous amount of problems begin with the birth of Ishmael. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord said to her, You are now with child, and you will have a son. Your name, you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Well, that's a, quite a powerful uh, time there, a powerful line. As we go through 16, read 15 and 16 closely. In 17, another very important chapter, we have the covenant of circumcision. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I'm God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. What an obligation that Abram had. I will confirm my covenant between you and uh, me, and you will greatly and will greatly increase your numbers. So he falls down before God. Uh, no longer will your name be Abram; your name will be Abraham. So here's the changing of the name in uh, Genesis 17. I've made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. So God is going to bless Abram, whose name is changed to Abraham, his line, his descendants, and He's going to raise him up. He's going to provide this land for him. And he's, uh, he says in verse 10, every male shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision. It will be sign of the covenant. So the sign of the covenant is in the circumcision of the male. Okay? They've circumcised themselves to God. They have offered themselves to God. Okay? They've offered their offspring to God. My covenant, um, verse 13, in your flesh is an everlasting covenant. In your flesh, okay? Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off. He has broken my covenant. So this is a very, very, very serious thing. And then we get into the whole second part of 17 when we look at Abram and his wife, Sarah. Her name will be Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, instead of S-A-R-A-I. I will bless her and he will give you a son. And they thought that that was crazy and they laughed in verse 17. Will a son be born by a man that's 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. So that was not God's will for Ishmael to be born to the maidservant Hagar. This child to be born is going to be Isaac. 
Um, and, um, and we will see later on that that is the child of the promise. Okay? We see in verse 18, the idea in verse 10, the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah laughed. In verse 12, am I, and am I worn out, and my master is old, that will I now have this pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child now that now I am old? Is anything too hard from the Lord? A great question in verse 14 of chapter 18. I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. She was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. So they were laughing at the Lord. The Lord made a promise to Abraham and to Sarah that she will be with child, and we shall see next time uh, that, in fact, she was. These chapters, chapter 13 in your post, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, very important, very significant in laying the foundation for the people of Israel. Enjoy. In chapter 9 of Hebrews, chapter 8, actually, we're starting in chapter 8. Now, Hebrews is written by someone, as I said last time, that we don't know who they are. We do not know the author. There have been various views about that. The significant thing is this: these are extraordinary chapters extraordinary chapters. So we're looking at 8, 9, 10. 8, 9, and 10. This is the high priest of a new covenant. Look at verse 6 of chapter 8. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior as theirs, to theirs, as the covenant in which he is mediator is superior to the old one and is founded on better promises. So we have the old covenant and then we have the new covenant. The new covenant is in Christ. The new covenant is significantly better than the old covenant. The promises are better. The new covenant mediated by Christ is richer, it's fuller, it is, um, it is more significant, and it's significantly better. You want to go with the new covenant, you don't want to stay with the old covenant. One of the problems of Hebrews is that the writer was encouraging them to stay in Christ instead of go back to Judaism. Stay in Christ. It's a better covenant. It has better promises. Verse uh, 10 of chapter uh, 8. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. And at that time, declares the Lord, I will put their law in their minds, write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. This is the famous Jeremiah 31 about the old covenant. Okay? I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. So the old covenant had great value, but the new covenant was better, and the old covenant becomes obsolete. It is not in force. The new covenant under Christ is the key one. Very important concept, and one of the things that the writer of the Hebrews is trying to show them. In chapter 9, we have the worship in the earthly tabernacle, now we get into the whole thing about the ark, the tabernacle, God appearing. This has tremendous Old Testament ramifications and background to that. And so he famously says in chapter 9, verse 11, When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say not part of this creation. He did not enter, he, Jesus, did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, which but he entered the most holy place once for all. Remember atonement once a year, Leviticus 16? By his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who were ceremonially unclean, sanctified them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit often himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences, from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. Again, a comparison with the new, the high priesthood in Jesus Christ compared to Israel's high priesthood, and the significance of Jesus' ministry over their ministry. Also, blood and goats do not compare to Jesus, the divine Son of God, uh, the second person of the Godhead, Holy Trinity, putting up his life or giving his life for one's eternal 
redemption. There's no comparison between those two things. His blood shed on the cross, as you know, having obtained eternal redemption. So, how much more the blood of Christ cleanses our consciences? from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. How much greater is the blood of Christ than the blood of goats and calves? They served a purpose. They, the old covenant, served a purpose, the day of atonement, but it's been supplanted and superseded by the life and death of Jesus Christ. Okay? He tells us at the end of uh, verse 22 of chapter 9, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So uh, we could look back into Leviticus and we know that someone has to die in order for our sins to be forgiven. Of course, it's Jesus. I love chapter 9, 27 and 28. Just as man is destined to die once, therefore there's no reincarnation. And after that, to face judgment. We all face the judgment of God after our death. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. One time, he's not coming back again to die. He will appear a second time, the second coming. Not to bear sin, he's already done that, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So he's going to be setting up his kingdom. This is what Revelation, the second half of Revelation is all about, what Christ, the glorified Christ, is going to do uh, upon his second coming. The 10th chapter of Hebrews is just extraordinary. That's the only word I can think of. The sacrifice of Christ the importance of the sacrifice of Christ, this brilliant writing of the uh, book of uh, the writer to the Hebrews, along with the, uh, his ability to take the Old Testament tax, text, tell us what they mean, and then interpret them in the light of the coming of Christ. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful uh, series of scriptures. Verse 10, And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. By Jesus' death on the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus, we are made holy when we put our faith and trust in him. In our repentance of our sins and our following Christ as Lord and Savior, he has, been, he has made us holy. By his sacrifice, we cannot be holy in and of ourselves. We cannot be holy outside the sacrifice of Christ. And our repentance unto sin and his bringing his righteousness. He takes our sin, we take on his righteousness and are saved. Therefore, brothers, verse 19, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain that is the body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere heart and full assurance of faith. See, Based on what Christ has done for us, we have this full assurance. We have this ability to go forward. We have this uh, assurance of our salvation. We have this assurance of going to heaven. We have this assurance of eternal life. So he says, let's go with a full assurance of faith and live accordingly. Live accordingly. Let us consider, verse 24, how we may spur one another on to, toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up, 25 of chapter 10, meeting together as some of in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Okay? All right. He says in verse uh, 30, it, 31, it is a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. You don't want to do that. You want to be prepared. You want to keep moving toward Christ. You want to be an obedient person toward the Lord. Verse 36, it's the whole chapter. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he's promised. You want the promise, but in order to get the promise, you have to persevere. You have to do the will of God. When you do the will of God, when I do the will of God, we receive the promise. In order to do the will of God, you have to persevere. You have to live by faith. Verse 38, my righteous one will live by faith. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, which is his concern but those who believe and are saved. Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 are very rich. Read them slowly. Again, you might have study notes. You might have an opportunity to um, be reading notes or maybe even a, pick up a Hebrew commentary, just a, a nice overview of Hebrews. It might be helpful. But if you're just reading straight, just read it very slow and prayerfully and carefully, and you will be very, very blessed. Now we move on through to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, 
43, we have the healing of the official son through 54 in your post. Um, Jesus does this extraordinary miracle. He says in verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. That's where it is now. Unless people see Jesus doing something, they don't necessarily believe. So the official says, sir, come down before my child dies. You may go, your son will live. He doesn't, he just says it and it happens. He just says it and it happens. He doesn't even go down there. So the man took Jesus' word, it's a good idea, and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. The father realized, verse 53, that this was the exact time at which Jesus said to him, your son will live. So he and his household believed. They believed because of the miracle. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. Now in chapter 5, we have this beautiful healing of the pool. It begins the chapter, and this long uh, conversation uh, from verse 16 to 30. Love verse 16 to 30, and it talks about uh, the life through the Son. My Father is always at work, verse 17, to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, he was even calling God his father, making himself equal with God. So that really bothered them because they did not in any way prepare themselves or have any kind of belief that the father actually had a son or was going to have a son. Actually, the father has always had a son because of the eternality of the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. But they were not aware of that. He has entrusted all judgment to the son in chapter 5, verse 22, that all may honor the Son as they honor the Father. So he's making himself co-equal with God, which was blasphemous in their mind, one of the reasons they killed him. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now he's drawing this this parallel between himself and the Father, and and he's going to state um, his uh, his relationship with the Father and the the Son is a very, very close relationship. And so if a person loves the son, they should love the father. If they love the father, they should love the son. This, for the Jewish people, was anathema. I tell you the truth, verse 24, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Okay? So what constitutes salvation? Believing in Christ, hearing his word, and you cross over from death to life. Okay, now, death to life is the eternality part of it. You, we are all going to die unless Jesus comes back again before we die. But when we die, we're either going to go to death or to life, heaven or to hell. Okay? Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice, verse 28, and come out, and those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. Doesn't get any simpler than that, folks. Uh, By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. That whole great understanding and expose of of the Father and the Son and how they work together and why Jesus is the judge and why he does what God wants him to do and the relationship they have is just very poignant. In chapter 6, we have the feeding of the 5,000. We see that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and now this miracle we also see in John. And then after that, you have Jesus' walk on water. I mean, now remember, that's 5,000 men. That doesn't include the women and children. And, of course, a person walking on water, I don't know what to say. He says, it is I, verse 20, do not be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. Immediately, the boat reached the shore where they were heading. So, he gets in the boat, and the boat eventually it, it gets to land. That's the miraculous kind of power he has. So he stands there, and the royal official's, official's son is healed. He walks on water. He feeds the 5,000. He heals the man at the, uh, at the pool in chapter 5, the first part of chapter 5. So we have this extraordinary person. Remember back to Abram in Genesis. He is the first step in moving toward the Messiah, 
who we now are seeing in the last part of our time together uh, in the daily lectionary when we look at the gospel, th this person in action. So try to tie all that together. And of course, in Hebrews, he's explaining the value of this person from a Old Testament perspective. It's extraordinary. Well, this is a great series of scriptures I think you would agree with me on. Enjoy, and we will see you next time when we look at the week of Fourth Epiphany. Enjoy the scriptures, and I pray that God would bless you with a wonderful week. God bless you.